And so today I talk about uh, large language models in 8-bit and emergent features. And this is work uh, with uh, Mike Lewis, Yunus uh, Belkada, and Luke Settlemeyer. And so um, this work is about quantization. And you can see quantization in two uh, different ways. Uh, uh, quantization as a window into neural networks, into understanding neural networks. And it's, it's a little bit like um, if you think about intelligence, it can be sort of seen as um, compression. If you're really good at compressing information, you're really good, you, you're basically really intelligent. And if you have that view, um, then um, information that is more important um, is more difficult to compress. And quantization is basically um, a, um, the compression of information from um, um, uh, a data format that has more information to a data format that has less information. And so um, by that sort of process, we can reveal what is actually an important part in the neural network and what is not so important. If we compress a part and um, we degrade the performance, we know like this part needs a higher precision. This part contains more information. And just to give you sort of an overview of what this ladder and, and um, quantization looks like, if we have um, the real uh, numbers between minus one and uh, one, then infinite number of those, uh, but we don't have infinite memory in computers, so we need to limit ourselves uh, to um, a certain amount of bits. If we have 32 bits, we have around 1 billion numbers in that interval, in 16-bit only 16,000, and in int 8 only 256. And so in this work, we do int 8 quantization, which is quite extreme. So um, we introduce a lot of small errors. And it's important to compress that information that um, is very dense with higher precision. And um, so, in this particular work, we found um, some extreme outliers that need higher precision. These outliers are extremely important. And so um, in this work, we could use quantization to understand an important part of transformers that was previously overlooked. The second uh, way how you can see quantization is just from a very practical um, perspective. Um, if you look at large language models, they've become so large that it's very difficult to actually do inference on them. So um, if you want to use the largest open source models like OPT 175 billion or Bloom, um, you need the best GPUs um, and eight of them um, to really do it on a single machine. But um, if you use 8-bit, you reduce the uh, um, size of the model by half. And with that, um, you can actually use it on um, academic servers. With You still need eight GPUs, but these are consumer GPUs. And so it's much easier to actually use these large models. And so here, quantization is a tool for accessibility of large models. And so these are the main views. And we will look at each of these views a little bit um, in this talk. Um, next, I will talk a little bit about uh, the background that you need. And this is mostly about quantization. And so um, if you think about quantization, you can uh, uh, always apply a three-step formula. And two of these steps are for quantization, one for dequantization, and the first quantization step is normalization, the second is rounding, and then the dequantization is the reversal of all these operations. And so um, if you have a data type like 16-bit um, floating point and you want to convert it to int 8, you first need to normalize it into the range of that data type. So in this case, minus 127 to 127, and you do that by, uh, in, most in most cases, by dividing by the absolute maximum value of the input vector. With that, you um, get, uh, get into the range minus 1, 1. And then you just need to scale by the maximum value, in this case, 127. And with that, you reach this uh, interval minus 127 to 127. And then you can use the second step rounding to get uh, conversion into the target data type. So you round to the closest value in the target data type. And um, the first step, if you want to recover the original values in the original data type, you um, do dequantization, which is uh, reverse of the previous operations. So in this case, you would um, divide by 127 and multiply by the absolute maximum value, and then you get back the original values. Um, here a little example with code. 
So on the left, we see code um, where you generate five random numbers. So we here do we do um, a quantization of a vector into an eight bit vector. And so first we um, calculate the absolute maximum value of that vector and then scale the tensor by or the vector by um, dividing by the absolute maximum, multiplying by 127. Then we round and we see um, the values on the right, they're now int eight. And if we dequantize um, the two vectors that you see on the right, one is the uh, first is the original vector, the second is uh, quantized and then dequantized by a uh, vector. And um, these um, here you can see basically the error between these two vectors and the average error is 0 0.002. And this is the quantization error that is basically propagated from layer to layer. And if this quantization error is too large, then you basically produce more and more noise with each layer. And if it's uh, too large, the entire output in the end will be just pure noise. And so with that, you degrade the performance. So what you want is the error to be as small as possible to um, preserve that information and introduce as a little noise as possible. Um, you can apply this technique, the very same technique to matrix multiplication. And so in this work, we do int eight matrix multiplication. So um, um, to compress the transformer, we compress the weights into eight, int eight. And that means we now need to use int eight matrix multiplication. And so we apply this three same steps. We normalize uh, into the range. Uh, then we um, round and uh, we can uh, multiply the two uh, matrices, in this case with the matrix multiplication. And in the third step, we denormalize again. In this case, we denormalize by um, um, both uh, normalization constants. And uh, so we multiply by the absolute ma maximum value of A and B, and then divide by the 127 square. And that recovers the 16-bit matrix multiplication output. Um, this is a matrix multiplication, but if you use this in a straightforward way, we get a problem. So uh, in this example, we use just a single value for the entire tensor uh, to find the absolute maximum value across the tensor. But if you have an outlier, this produces very large errors, and it will prevent you from um, basically having any effective method. So here I have the same code on the left as before, but now we insert an outlier into this vector with a magnitude of minus four, um, uh, minus five. And so we see the previous error was 0 0.002. Now the error is 0 0.009. And this um, is because um, the absolute maximum value is now five, and that reduces the precision of all other values in the vector. And so um, this is the main problem that we solve in the paper. How can you quantize um, very large outliers um, with high precision? And we develop uh, this method LLM int 8, and it consists of two different uh, methods, a vector-wise quantization and mixed precision decomposition. Um, Vector-wise quantization, um, I will not go into too much detail here. You can read the paper or the blog post for more information. But uh, the main idea is that instead of having a normalization constant for each tensor, we can have a matrix multiplication normalization constant for each row and each column of matrix B. And um, with that, we um, can do the, basically each inner product in the matrix multiplication has its own normalization constant. And with that, if an outlier is contained in a row, for example, then the next row is not affected by that outlier. And that increases the overall precision. And um, then um, we get a much better um, output. We have a lower error in the matrix multiplication output. To undo the uh, operation, we um, perform denormalization through the uh, outer product of these two vectors. And this is vector-wise quantization. So um, if we apply this, um, this is a high precision quantization technique. It still doesn't quite work. Um, if we, here we have zero shock performance on some tasks for large language models. And um, the x-axis is the size of the model. And so um, as we scale, we see the orange line, which is 
vector-wise quantization uh, decreases in the performance to a random level. And uh, the green line is um, the 16-bit baseline that we try to match. And so we see this quantization technique alone doesn't work. Something really strange is going on around 6.7 billion parameters. And that's what we solve with the next method. Um, and that is mixed precision decomposition. So what we found is when we inspected um, basically um, the transformer at this scale, that um, some very large outliers form that are highly systematic. And uh, we are pretty lucky um, because if they wouldn't be systematic, we would have needed to do like some complex sparse matrix multiplication. What we can do in this case is um, two dense matrix multiplications. And that is so because these outliers are just contained in the hidden dimension, in particular hidden dimensions. So if we have a hidden state, and the hidden state has the shape of batch sequence dimension and hidden dimension, so it has three dimensions. Then um, particular hidden dimension will have very large values, larger than six. And um, because we have a layer normalization, usually we have values between uh, minus 3.5 and 3.5. And it would be very uh, unusual to have values larger than six. So we know that from that, that basically the transformer wants these values to be that large. It uh, learned these values on purpose and it stored them all in the particular hidden dimensions. And so what we can do is um, we extract these large values from those dimensions, do the matrix multiplication of these dimensions in 16-bit, and we do the matrix multiplications of all other dimensions that do not contain outliers in 8-bit. And this is still memory efficient and fast because 99.9% .9 of all dimensions do not have outliers. Only 0.1% of dimensions have as outliers. Um, but um, so it's very few dimensions, but these dimensions are extremely important. And uh, that, that's basically exactly what I said that with quantizations, we get a better picture of what is important in the network. And so with this method, we have the full LLM int 8 method, uh, vector-wise quantization and mixed precision decomposition. And that is shown in blue here. And we see that we basically um, maintain 16-bit performance. So um, if you want to statistically uh, sort of measure it, um, the difference between the 16-bit baseline and the LLM int 8 method um, is only one third of the standard error. So um, in statistical terms, it means if you run 10 different models, four models of int 8 will be better than FP16, and only six models will be worse. So it's very close to random performance that you would expect if the models, uh, if the methods are the same. So this is pretty good. Um, this is pretty close. Um, I, I don't think you get much closer to no performance degradation. So with this, we can um, easily use this method um, as a replacement because it doesn't degrade performance. So there's no reason not to use it. And so we spent quite some time to uh, make it easy to use in hugging face transformers. So um, any model that you have in hugging face transformers that uses the auto model, you can now run an 8-bit. For that, you need these three libraries, um, bits and bytes, which is the 8-bit library, then transformers and accelerate, which are the hugging face libraries. And the only thing that you need to change is three arguments. And so um, there's a main argument load in 8-bit, uh, the vice map and then the max memory um, that indicates how much memory your GPUs have. And um, with these three changes, um, the model will be loaded um, in 8-bit uh, tensor by tensor, converted on the GPU to 8-bit. And so it means that you also don't need that much CPU memory. So you save both CPU memory and GPU memory. And with this, um, you can load much larger models than usual. So um, that makes these large models uh, much more accessible. That was sort of the first part. Um, the second part is um, about emergent features. And this is like the really interesting part about this paper uh, because we found these um, very weird um, outliers that behave in a very systematic way um, before I talk about these, um, I want to talk a little bit about definitions so it makes it a little bit easier to follow. 
Um, first, a little bit about, uh, I talk a little bit about emergence and then what are emergent features, what are features and what does it mean um, to have an emergent feature? So um, there are many definitions about emergence, but if I put it in my own words, I would describe it as emergence is a gradual change in a property that suddenly undergoes a phase shift and then changes the quality of its substrate. Um, emergence happens a lot in nature. And here are just some examples. For example, if water transitions to ice, that is emergence or um, if it's the crystallization of a snowflake, there are different shapes of snowflakes that happen under particular conditions. And these conditions determine the emergence of a particular snowflake shape. Um, you also have, to, for example, charges in the air that lead to a lightning strike or animals that have a certain behavior in the individual, but once they have that behavior in a group, it protects actually the entire group against predators or has some advantages. And uh, probably the most um, elusive thing overall is if you take dead proteins and you surround it with a dead membrane, suddenly it becomes alive and it's life and it multiplies and um, lives and moves. Um, if we look at emergence and transformers, how I define it is um, at the beginning, you have stochastic outlier features in the hidden state, which are large, but they don't occur in all layers. And once uh, the phase shift happens, outlier features occur in every layer in a transformer in every hidden state. And once this happens, um, some properties of the transformer change. For example, attention becomes very sparse, or these outliers um, grow rapidly and they destroy our quantization. And um, that's why this is so important for quantization. Um, a couple more definitions just to make clear um, what I mean with the feature and where you can find it. So uh, a feature is a weak predictor for a class. So um, if you have, for example, a data set of uh, animals and you want to have, um, you want to detect cats, then uh, a cat eye is a pretty good feature for a cat. If you detected a cat eye in a feature, it's pretty likely that probably a cat is in the, feature, uh, in the, in the picture. And um, that, that uh, a cat eye is, for example, a feature. And natural language processing features are more complex they're like linguistic features, but most features are probably not easily interpretable. Um, if we look at the location of a feature, basically what I mean is particular hidden dimensions. So again, if we have a hidden state with uh, dimensions batch sequence hidden, then a feature dimension is equal to the uh, hidden dimension. And so if we have some index uh, in the hidden dimension, um, that would mean that we index particular features. Um, then two more important definition, what I mean with an outlier feature and an emergent feature. An outlier feature is um, a hidden dimension value, a feature that is particularly large. For example, it might take on the value of 30 uh, on average across a dimension. And that is uh, much, much, much larger than uh, the usually maximum value of about three. Um, and the difference between an outlier feature and an emergent feature is that an emergent feature happens in every layer uh, for every hidden state. And so you can express it um, basically these pro the difference between outlier feature and emergent feature by the proportion of layers that have an outlier feature. And so if the proportion hits 100%, then the feature becomes emergent. So um, with these definitions, um, we can move ahead. And so um, first things first, um, um, we found these outlier features, um, but are they really important? And as I said, with quantization, there's a hint that these are important, but can we do more direct experiments? So what we do is um, we look at these outlier features and remove them. And then we look at some random features and remove them. And then we see what influence uh, these uh, removals have. And so if the outlier features do not have any big effect, if they're not important, then we would um, expect that the degradation uh, of performance is just as much as for random features. But what we find is even though the features only make uh, up 0.1%, the perplexity degrades by a factor of six to 10 
And these outlier features make up 20% of the overall attention mass. And uh, if you remove the random features, um, the degradation is very small. So we know, okay, these outliers are really important. Um, so our quantization technique helped to detect these, and these truly are important. Um, and then um, we have four main findings in our paper. Um, the first two um, concern the question, um, how does emergence happen? Does it happen suddenly or is it a smooth transition? Uh, the third one is um, a supporting uh, evidence for the view that um, emergence is smooth. And the fourth one is the main one that basically concerns quantization. Um, it shows that once emergence happens, outliers grow very rapidly and basically destroy quantization. As we've seen in the quantization example early, if we add an outlier, we increase the error a lot. And if we add much, much larger outliers, like in this case, um, basically the performance goes to random. Our quantization produces just noise. It's no longer has no longer has any information. And so um, let's dive into these results. Um, so the first is, do we have sudden or smooth emergence? And so here we have a plot um, of, in blue, uh, the uh, proportion of layers affected. I mean, as I said before, if 100% of layers, so all layers have outliers, we consider that to be emergent. And that is a dashed line. If you look at the token dimension, that also increases similarly, but it doesn't reach 100%. It um, stops once all layers are affected. Um, if we look at the model size in parameters and billion parameters, that's what you see on the left, we see that um, sort of it increases a little bit and then around 6 billion uh, parameters, it stops. And then it suddenly increases to 100%, around 6.7 billion, and then it stays there. So there it seems that this shift is very rapid. As you go from 6 to uh, 6.7 billion, uh, this shift happens. And um, yeah, so that seems very sudden. On the right, we look at models in terms of perplexity. And here it's important to, um, to keep in mind that a model size is not, um, not necessarily predictive of uh, the perplexity of a model. For example, we know that GPT-2 models are a little bit undertrained, they're trained on a little bit less data. Whereas if you, for example, look at Chinchilla, um, Chinchilla uh, was trained on much, much more data than GPT-3. And so while it's smaller, it has lower perplexity. And so this plot just looks at the perplexity of models. And here we actually see a smooth transition. So um, um, this is, would be a very important finding um, because that means we can um, detect emergence early. We can look at small models, look at a couple of data points on small models and see how these properties change. And from that, we can predict if some properties might be emergent or not. So um, what view is correct? The sun view or the um, smooth emergence? And here we get some good data if we look just at the number of outliers. As I said, we only have 0.1% um, of the hidden dimension are outliers. And so this means that basically we just have a handful of outliers, even for our large models. And uh, if we plot it in uh, perplexity, according to perplexity, then as, as um, the perplexity decreases, we get more and more outliers. And so this is a strictly mon monotonic relationship. So um, um, whenever we decrease outliers, we have a guarantee of there will always be equal amount or more outliers. Um, I haven't done the plot with parameters, but if you plot it with parameters, you get a wavy pattern. So um, the model size is not necessarily predictive of how many outliers you have. And that gives us some evidence that okay, probably the smooth interpretation is more correct. Um, it's difficult to talk about perplexity with people. So usually I still say, okay, there's emergence after 6.7 billion parameters, but you should keep in mind that the correct interpretation is probably that uh, emergence is directly related to perplexity. Model size is also strongly related to perplexity, but as I said, if you would use more data, probably you would have emergence at like 2.7 billion parameters or so. 
And um, then um, um, our last finding, and this is a critical finding for the quantization. Um, um, once emergence happens, the outlier, the median outlier magnitude increases rapidly. And so um, it goes then to 40 and 60. Um, I, haven't, I, I do not have it on this plot, but um, if you look at larger models like OPT 66 billion and 30 billion, and um, what you see is it sort of levels off. And the largest models seem to have outliers about 100 in size. And so the full plot of this, um, this curve would be basically you have a uh, flat, then it rapidly increases, and then it flattens off again. Uh, so some kind of uh, logistic curve. And um, yeah, that is the main reason why um, we um, see these problems at scale, uh, why we see these problems in quantization with 6.7 billion parameters, because after emergence, uh, we have very large outliers destroy our uh, quantization. Yeah, and th that is everything. Um, so to conclude, um, we um, have shown that with LLM and H, which is this two-part quantization method, we can quantize very large models, 175 billion parameters with no de degradation of performance. And so that makes these large models much more accessible. Um, we have also shown that with quantization, we can uncover emergent features and um, can try to understand them uh, um, um, in, in those models. And our work is the first work that shows we can actually understand emergence by directly looking at the transformer. And yeah, that's everything that I have. Uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Dave. That was amazing.